and welcome back. Um, part two of this Richard Hucknell, you know, the life and death of a paedophile. Um, let's, let's go back a bit and then, so, if, you know, if you've really, if you've only joined on, this, on number two, you really should watch number one because you've missed so much. So what we said in number one was about Richard Hucknell, where he was um, well educated, he was, you know, middle class upbringing, comes from, um, you know, Ashford in Kent, uh, English man, but his crimes were done in Malaysia. Um, he was then arrested and charged in this country. And in this video, we're going to look into that part of it now. Um, in that other video, we talked about the different techniques, didn't we? About what was now being used, you know, from the freckles to your knuckles to, your, you know, like our fingerprints to the vein of, um, pattern analysis and all this sort of stuff we talked about. And we talked about the case that was really, you know, um, uh, an English case of a um, person that I couldn't mention because he got off, so I can't mention it. But you need to watch number one. Now, in this part of it, we're going to talk about the arrest and the trial um, of Richard. Um, and then also we're going to talk about Richard's murder and also about his murderer in this part. So stay tuned. So we've had all this um, evidence, haven't we, come in about him. You know, we've had the Australian um, task force now, this task force Argos, you know, knowing that this um, man was a prolific paedophile and he was online doing um, God knows what um, with these photos. He was also planning now on writing this um, paedophile manual and different things like that. And I think the other person I think that we talked about with the paedophile manual actually talking about that was in the James Bulger case, wasn't it? And um, Venables, he um, was creating this, um, you know, paedophile manual that seems to be something they love to do. They think they've got something to share and they want to share it. I mean, this man's paedophile uh, um, manual was massive and detailed. And I think that's how they found out a lot about him once they got him caught, was about this, you know, his techniques and how he done it and stuff um, on that. But when they was searching for him, and I said they found this freckle and they knew, you know, identifying marks on the hands. And we talked about um, Professor, you know, Dame Professor uh, Susan Black and her team and how they started developing stuff. So they started looking on Facebook for people. Yes, for hands and different things like that to see if they could find someone you know similar or someone had similar markings i mean you're talking about a lot of work here these task force and these police you know really really put in a lot of work here to try and get this man this man was a paedophile for over you know a decade so they needed to catch him this was a very serious man so this profile they found they sort of followed the leads and stuff like that but it was a fake profile okay as with many of these, and they're never going to use their own names. They're never going to. They're never going to do it. But what there was in there, I think, it was a photo of a vehicle of a car in there. And this police led them to this um, Shannon uh, McCall, uh, a care worker from Adelaide, another care worker from Adelaide. But nothing about Adelaide, but a care worker. You know, really, this never, this never gets any better, I think, for care workers. And we get some great care workers, don't we, that work bloody hard. And then you have people like this that literally, um, you know, just abuse the system and abuse the people. And as I said, there's not much difference between a child being abused and um, an, an, an elderly person being abused. They, they, they hold the same weight. And that's why if you've got a criminal offence against a child, you won't work with them and you won't work with them if you have that. So that's about that. So this warrant was issued anyway, for this arrest of this um, McCall. Now, upon entering his house, the police discovered um, that actually at the point of they entered, he was online. He was on there. He was on the dark web. It was all set up. He didn't have time to close it down and, and um, stop anything. Now, for the police, especially this Australian task force, this was like a bloody miracle because I'm telling you now, a paedophile and a paedophile, people like this in these rings and, and the, all over the world, 
would never ever, if they thought they was going to be raided or, or in any way being watched, that would have been gone. That material, that, that thing would have gone off and you'd never have found that data. Now what these done, these um, task force did, they kept the profile open, they kept the computer on. Then they started to track from his computer. So again, not caught by, um, caught by hard work, yes. But as with all these paedophiles, especially these ones online, caught by accident really. It was a photograph. It was really, they're looking for a profile of something on someone's hand, a freckle. That then the photograph shows up a car. Even though the profile was fake, the car was real. They get to the house, where the car, they find the paedophile online, on the dark web, with all this stuff on it. I mean, you couldn't have wrote it, really. If I was writing a story about catching someone, that would never be in it, because that is so rare, really. But from that, they then started to build this case. Now, listen, they run this profile of this paedophile on this site, and lucky they did, because what it did, um, um, they rescued about 85 um, <laughs> children uh, from ongoing abuse, and also arrested hundreds of paedophiles from this one site that this man had opened. Okay, so they saved 85 children. That's a lot of children to save. It's not a lot in the context, I suppose, of what's going on out there, but my God, it's better not saving any, isn't it, really, when you think about it? So good for them for doing that. Um, after they, um, I think other members stood out, and especially Hucknell really stood out, because he was this prolific, you know, uploader of videos. He was just so intent on um, putting everything he knew about paedophilia, everything he was doing to these children up, he wanted them to know. He was one of their main members. You know, and don't forget they make money off these videos and these films and these books that he wanted to sell. You know, his, uh, um, you, know, you know, all this stuff, this man had designed to make a living. He wanted to do this full time. That's what he was planning, full time paedophile. So they sort of had an idea who he was. Right? Because of certain things that were said on there, certain things that they've done, they've got this profile of him. Now, he was due to return from Malaysia to um, England for you know, Christmas, spending Christmas with his family, as any normal person would do. You know, if you work overseas, and I've worked overseas, you come home and stuff. I've lived overseas, you come back for Christmas. That's what he was planning on doing, because he thought he was safe, you see. He's a paedophile that really thought, I'm never going to get caught, am I? I can do all this because I'm hiding my face, I'm hiding this, I'm doing this. He didn't know this. McCall had been caught and they was running his site and they're drawing him in and drawing him in and drawing the other hundreds of paedophiles in and collecting them all up, really. Um, so he then decides I'm coming back to England and I'm going to, you know, uh, go and see my family and then I'll chill out for a few, few weeks and then I'll go back and I'll start it all over again. How wrong was he? So he was um, arrested. I think uh, I think the Australian um, task force informed the um, National Crime Agency that he would be returning to the UK on the 19th of December 2014. Um, and he arrived at Gatwick Airport and he was arrested there and then. So this man did not have a good Christmas at all, did he, really? So listen, they've questioned him, and as always, you know, it's no comment, no comment, no comment, because that's their right to do that, you know, and um, that's what he did. Plus, because he did really believe that there would be no evidence against him, and if they did have some evidence, it wouldn't be a lot, and so they wouldn't get him on a lot anyway. So he was released out on bail, because that's all they could really do was release him out on bail, and he was bowed to his family's address with his family, and there was no young children in this family at all, and part of his conditions of bail would be that he wouldn't be able to go anywhere near a child or anything else. So he was then allowed to go home with the mother and father. And when he was at home with the mother and father, his mother said to him, what's going on? Is this true? What have you done? You need to tell me the truth. Don't forget they're very religious people. 
He had had a good life, and I've said this before right from the beginning. This man had no real reason to do this, really. There was nothing in his background that made him do it. It's good family. Now this mother, and it must be a terrible thing to have to sit there and ask your son, what have you done when you know that he's been arrested for these sort of crimes? And she wanted the truth. She wanted him to be honest. And actually, I think for once in his life, he was. And he told her what he'd been doing. I think he knew something was coming because he had his phone taken off him. He had his um, laptop taken off him at time of arrest. Now, don't forget this man at the time of his arrest had no criminal records at all in this country or any other country. None at all. So the parents, I don't know, I think when they was, he was bowed back to them and they thought, you know, well, you, I think they could see he was worried and, and everything else. And I think when he was honest with his mother, I don't, I don't know if he realised the reaction that he was going to get. I think he probably thought, well, you know, because I think he'd come across as quite a spoiled child, been given everything, you know, this um, life and he'd been in Malaysia and these places where people had treated him like some god and um, I think it had gone through his head a bit so when he said to her yes it's all true um, she rang the police once she got him removed from her home and if he didn't have a bow address he couldn't he had to go into custody so where they was going to leave him at the mother's while they'd done further inquiries and looked at all his computers and everything else he was immediately taken back into custody and she sort of disowned him I don't think she could believe what she was hearing. But there was no way that she was going to have that man in her home after that day, and nor did she. So now he's in custody. So when <laughs> she rang the police, actually, I'm going to have to say it, she told the police exactly what he said to her, that he had raped children between the ages of 3 and 13, at which his point, you know, his parents just couldn't believe it. It turns out that they was actually between six months, I think, and 13. I think he didn't tell him. I don't know why he thought a three-year-old was different to a six-month-old, but he didn't tell her that. But that's what she told the police. Again, though, once he got back in to custody, he denied all that, but he still then remained in custody waiting to go to trial. So for them to keep now Hucknell, Richard Hucknell, in um, custody. They had to charge him and they charged him with 91 counts, I think, um, uh, including the creation of and, and processing um, of child pornography, rape uh, uh, of a child under the age of 12, digital penetration, child abuse, facilitating and commissioning uh, child sexual offences and creating a paedophile manual. That's what he was charged on. And the reason he was charged on the 91 counts is from this paedophile manual. But let's not forget, this is what they knew about or they could prove because this man really wasn't going to admit anything, ever. So listen, he tried to get bail again and his bail was actually this time denied. By the time now he'd gone for this second bail, trying to get another address, They'd gone through all this computer stuff, what they could find and stuff. There was a lot of stuff on there, you know, that was um, encrypted and they couldn't get to it. There was passwords they couldn't get into. This man knew what he was doing. Um, but the stuff they could find was enough for them to hold him without bail. I think he was then, in the end, I think he, it, was, um, it was transferred in the end, I think, to Belmarsh uh, Prison in, in London where he awaited trial. So really from you know, the 19th of December, really, 2014, this man was in prison. So here again, as you see, this we have this man. So the initial hearing at the Old Bailey in London was on the 16th of January. Uh, no, sorry, it's in January 2016. Um, and Richard pleaded not guilty to all counts, all 91 counts uh, charges, which, uh, it, listen, the court, it took over an hour to read out these charges in court, so I'm not going to read them all out. It would be impossible for me to do that. I'd be, it'd be 10 videos long. Um, and also the prosecution started to pair, prepare a separate trials um, because they didn't believe that the jury, so they wanted, what happened was they wanted two different trials because they didn't believe or feel that the jury could handle 
hearing such graphic detail of all these charges in that one go. So they believe they should split the trial. And so two juries would listen to it because of the gravity and the damage that that could cause to someone really when you think you're hearing all this evidence you're going to see all these pictures and stuff they're not nice okay it's not nice for anybody but I think really um, it was it was difficult so I think it was decided that it's just going to be a single trial because they just needed to get it done now don't forget this man did not commit the offences in the UK he committed offences in Malaysia. So we're going to talk about this extraterritorial extra um, jurisdiction. Now what that is, it's like, uh, you can break it up and I'll probably write it in um, ETJ. Um, it's the legal ability of one government to exercise authority beyond its normal boundaries. Now if Hucknell had committed the crimes in the UK, he would automatically have gone through our courts. But he committed the crimes abroad, didn't he? So really, uh, Malaysia could have done it. I don't think, and I think the Australian government and this government, they wanted to get him back here. So the minute he hit the soil on our soil, they used this extradition, like this um, extra territorial jurisdiction to charge him under that. Now, not many people have been charged. It's been used several times. So this extra territorial jurisdiction and it's the Hucknall was prosecuted under section 72 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 uh, which allows British nationals to be tried and convicted in the United Kingdom so the minute he stepped foot in England he was then liable he was then he, they would then be able to if there was enough evidence which they believe they had and if there was enough public interest which they believe there was to have this man arrested the minute he stepped off the plane and charged under this section of the Sexual Offences Act and by using this extra territorial jurisdiction um, uh, act it, it, it's really for serious, serious crimes so, but they have to be able to prove it and it has to be within the public interest this definitely was so um, I think in, uh, and I think this is what, when they do about this, um, people that go abroad, and they go abroad just to abuse children, it's for that. It's a deterrent to say, you may have done that crime there, and they not, may not be able to get you, but we will still prosecute you and charge you, you know, and prosecute and put you in prison for the crimes that you've done in another country, because you're English, because you're a British national. That's what we can do. And under this... Um, section and under this act that's how they get it because you have this don't you paedophile tourism thing they, they you know these men and women that go abroad as tourists and think this is what they can do well no you can't because now there are other ways that, that's what i'm saying one of these days if you're not caught yet you will be there is lots of other ways now that you will be prosecuted so whether you're going to go to malaysia and you're going to do these things australia use this as well and they will prosecute you as the same as they would in that country um, for doing these offences against children and the same with the UK. Now this um, you know, extraterritorial jurisdiction has been really um, accepted well by the people that try to protect children, um, especially all across the world, because it's, it's going to limit. People think, if they can think they can get away with it, they're going to do it even more. It's not going to stop everyone, is it? It doesn't stop everyone because people like Hucknall think thought he was untouchable, literally. But in the end, it wasn't. He wasn't, was he? He was caught, cool. and he was caught, cool and he was charged under this, and that's how he could not get away with. Even though he'd done these crimes in Malaysia, he got prosecuted here. He was sentenced here in the UK, and he was imprisoned here. So in April of 2016 during the preliminary hearing trial uh, Richard Hucknall pleaded guilty to 71 of the 91 charges now he was facing this after he watched all the evidence against him what the court had against him and part of that evidence was the distinguishing marks that he had so even though his face wasn't distinguished in this the pictures of him there was 
you know, identifying marks on him, even down to a freckle. So he admitted 71 charges out of the 91. And that's how he was really caught because it would have been difficult to prove all these charges against him unless he had been, this evidence had been put in front of him and he admitted that, which saved a lot of time. But there were some other things as well that come out of this trial. Um, so, you know, these 20 charges, the extra 20 charges, they weren't dropped, they was like put, they remained on file for, la for later use if needed. But really, you know, when you've got someone that's already up for 71 um, charges, uh, it's a waste of time really to try and get the rest of them unless you know that these are so weak. Also, they knew there was a lot more children than the children that they've um, said in here, up to two, three hundred children, they think, if not more. And this is by this paedophile manual that he was making. But listen, they got this man, didn't they, in the end, off the streets, um, really, and off the, not off our streets, because he probably wouldn't have done it here. I mean, if he did do it here, we, we don't know, but he wouldn't have been so prolific, I think, here. He went to these countries, poor countries, and really used and abused these children because he thought he was entitled and he thought he could. So listen, at this trial, you know, the <laughs> scale of this man's crimes really become evident, really, it did. You know, and I've got in 2006, you know, um, and then for the next eight or nine years, he continued then to abuse until he was apprehended in 2014. So this is a long time. We have a prolific paedophile abusing children across the world, really. Uh, and a lot of these children will never be able to be identified. Right, so this is what, I suppose, <laughs> what these include, these charges included, and what else came out of this trial included, was the rape of children under the age of 12, it, the possession and distribution of child pornography, or it's seen obscene images of children. This is a court reference where it says pornography. I actually prefer to use the word in indecent images of children. I don't like the word pornography um, when it relates to these sort of charges, but that's that's how they write it and, and that's how it is. Creation of this child uh, pornography, child abuse, uh, creating a paedophile manual uh, entitled Paedophiles and Poverty, um, Child Lover's Guide, Digital Penetration of a Child Aged uh, 12 and under, raising money for the activities via a crowd, now via a crowd funding website. A crowd, you know, <laughs> funding website to fund his research and his abuse and his writings of this stuff. And people paid lots of it. So his victims aged between six months and 12 years. One was abused while wearing a nappy. The other was abused for a number of years between the ages of five and 12. You remember the ones that he wanted to abuse, you know, have a relationship with, had children with, even though he didn't want to incest, but he would have, he would have abused his own anyway because, you know, abu you know, incest wasn't his thing, but oh well, you know, these are the ones that he said that, you know, um, they were better than his dog, they were more loyal than his dog, these children that he's talking about. He belonged to this uh, uh, website called The Love Zone uh, on the dark web, which, um, <laughs> it, it, listen, you, you can't just stumble across this web page, right? You'd have to go looking for it and you wouldn't want to look for it. There's no excuse for looking for this. The minute you go into this website, and some force somewhere is looking on there, you're going to be picked up. And that's why loads of people have been arrested because they've gone into these websites. It's only an accident. No, it's not an accident. You can't accidentally go into these websites. You have to look and really know what you're doing to go into these websites. There's no excuse. So unless, you know, don't go into these websites. I might name it, but don't go into it. It's no excuse to go into it to take a look because what you're looking at is you're only looking at it if that's what you want to see. There is no excuse. If you're found out on this website, 
you will be prosecuted the same as anybody else. And it was on this site and on other sites, but mainly on this site that he shared his photograph and his videos and his writings and, you know, comments out to people. He boasted about his crimes to other paedophiles, boasting such comments as hit the jackpots. Um, when a three-year-old girl is as loyal to me as my dog. Um, <laughs> and nobody seems to care. This is what he kept saying. Nobody seems to care, you know, hit the jackpot. And impoverished kids are definitely much easier to, 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 deduce, to seduce than middle class kids. Meaning he's tried middle class kids then as well. That's what I read from that. So again, this is the mentality of this man. There was a series of posting in 2013 where he admitted sexually abusing four girls in the same family. He awarded himself points uh, for sexually abusing children and, and um, could not win points if he abused the same child in the same week. Got points for it. Hucknall wrote that he wanted to marry this girl that he had raped for several years and have children. As again, I've said to you, you know, he's not a fan of uh, incest. All this is on this site and in this diary, in this paedophile manual for everyone to read and buy. So listen, all they really got from this man was about 29 victims, uh, well over 20,000 um, photos and videos, 20,000. 20,000, that's 20,000 times a child's been abused, minimum. This is what they know about. They believe there's up to around 200 victims plus, um, all from Southeast Asia and thousands more photos encrypted um, areas on Hucknall's laptops and uh, which authorities cannot access. Now, you know, <laughs> And we'll, we'll talk about the access in this in a minute, but you know, this man wasn't stupid. You know, why can they not access this stuff? We should be able, there should be technology. We, we Listen, if we go out and, you know, try and break into a car, you wouldn't get into it. But you can abuse a child, you can um, film a child and, and distort the images and do this and encrypt it, but no one can catch you. But the technology they're building for other stuff, but they won't put the technology into that to help the authorities, help the police, help these people stop these predators. Shocking, really. The vast majority of the stuff on this man's computer and on everything else that they couldn't get into, there was no way that he was going to give them any information at all. He refused to help them. He never um, gave them any passwords or anything like that no matter how much they asked and what they tried to do, there was no way that this man was going to give anything away. So yes, he was charged with just that, but there was plenty, plenty more. And really, we know that these videos, you know, 200 or whatever there was of them, or, you know, 20,000, sorry, of them, was only a small percentage of what this man um, had put out there in that time from about 2005 to 2014. There was a lot of images and a lot of videos and a lot of kids that were abused, sexually abused, raped by this man and um, put out there for the rest of this, you know, so-called community to use. In this paedophile manual, there is one bit that sticks out, I think, and I think, that, uh, I think this is what even the, the judge sort of realised is that this man, as I said to you, is in his orphanage, wasn't he? You know, he kept wanting to try and approach the pastors and all this to get him access to these orphans. Again, you know, uh, they're in poverty. These people are trying to do their best for these kids. You've got the churches trying to look after them. You've got people like him coming in and saying they're going to help and they're really abusing these children. At one of these um, orphanages, there was a family and some of the kids were brought in, you know, because there was a birthday party going on and he walked the girl whose birthday it was home and he raped her on the way home. You know, this man destroyed lives. This man has continued to destroy lives just because someone lives in poverty. You know, what makes them different to someone that's middle class? Nothing. They still feel the same. The pain has still been the same. The abuse would still be the same. The effects 
will still be the same. This man didn't care at all. He only cared about himself. And all these crimes, and the judge have said it, they've all said it, is about this man's own sexual gratification. That's all it was ever about. His control, his power. So he had this book, and then he had this ledger. So he'd score himself, and he'd also have this ledger then that he would, um, <laughs> you know, he would score himself and how, how bad the abuse was, how much it hurt. You know, so he'd have these points score if he only abused, you could only abuse them once in one week. But then it would be what he did to them would also give him more points in this ledger. And so this is sort of how these kids were worked out. But we don't know how long he'd had this ledger for, and we don't know if there was more than one ledger. There probably was. But, you know, it, it shows you about the mind of this man. There's no reform for this man, even though, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, he tries to say there is. Um, and also his reasons why he done it. So during <laughs> this sentence in hearing, Hucknall's lawyer, Philip um, Sapford, QC, read out a statement from Hucknall himself, where he blames his crimes on his immaturity. He was immature, didn't realise what he was doing. He says he really understands, this is in his words, Hucknall's words, I really understand and acknowledge the true scale and damage of a uh, cause to the Malaysian community. No, I don't think he did actually ever um, understand the gravity of, of it at all. I hoped, he says, to have escaped this mundane, mundane life of solitude in the UK, yet was overwhelmed by this attention um, I received in Malaysia. Also, it's their fault. I completely misjudge the affections of these children and receive, you know, and how they received me and how I received them, I misunderstood. You know, it's because I'm immature. My low self-esteem, my lack of confidence with women was no excuse for me to use these children as an outlet. I am open and eager for rehabilitation from this offending behaviour. I do not want to become a mantra to the sex tourism in Malaysia. This was my doing and as a consequence of my immaturity and I am truly <laughs> remorseful. Really, that's his words. But how can you be remorseful but you won't give out your passwords? How can you be remorseful when you won't give out the identity of all the children that you've done this to over these years? Because one, a lot of the pictures are distorted when the facial images are gone. There were so many images on these computers that this man would not give up at all. But he's, re you know, he feels, you know, remorse. No way, no way. Immaturity. He wanted to escape from this solitude life in the UK. That was his reason for doing this. He wanted, he misunderstood these children's affection towards him. So it's their fault. This man is a disgrace in humanity, really. He used and abused these children across these countries. He really did. He used and abused them. He planned it. He made money from it. He, can, he would have continued. Do you think he was going to come back to England for the few weeks holiday and not go back and continue what he was doing? Absolutely not. If this man had not been caught, he would still be continuing to do this to these children. Now look, I know what his lawyer has to do. You know, the, this lawyer, Stafford, this QC, he continued to ask the judge, you know, to take into consideration that the client's age and, you know, and, um, uh, and his claims of remorse and that the fact that he had no previous convictions. He had no previous convictions because he wasn't caught, not because he hadn't done the crime. 
He'd done the crime, he just hadn't been caught. And he wasn't young. He didn't come, you know, he wasn't stupid. There was no other reason why this man done it, only because he could. Now I know, I, I know they have to do their job. You know, and he says that, you know, you know, the psychiatrist before says about, you know, his limited sexual experience with women and he suffered depression as a teenager. There was no, well, you know, a lot of men are worried about, you know, relationships with women because they're quiet or maybe withdrawn, but they don't go on to abuse. They usually get a bit of confidence. They meet someone who has the same character as them and they always meet someone and they end up having a good life. This was an excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse because why because now the man's been caught and now he doesn't want to go to prison for all this time does he because he knows exactly what's going to happen to him and now we'll go on to that so anyway you know he was sentenced i said at the beginning i think he got 22 uh he got uh, life imprisonment on 22 counts and he was, had to serve 25 years minimum before he got parole. He would not have got out. There's no way he would have got out. And I've, I've said it with all these paedophiles, you know, especially this sort of the gravity of this man as a, as a paedophile, whether they make it to the end of their 25 years is another issue altogether. You know, because the prison has a hierarchy. And even if it hasn't got a hierarchy um, for these sort of people, it's got other people that want to make a name for themselves in prison. They're in there a long time and sometimes you've just got psychopaths that don't like you and they're going to kill you anyway. So this is why this video is called the life and death of a paedophile. Because after this man was sentenced, he was sent, of course, to prison and we're going to talk about that now. Now, listen, this part of this case it's different from the rest. It's quite descriptive in what I talk about, in what they did, in what he did to this man. And I am going to say exactly what happened to this man. And then I'm going to talk about the perpetrator of that crime and about what he did. So if this is too much for you or you feel you don't want to listen to, to this part, then, then maybe you should switch off now. So as I've said, on the 19th of December 2014, Richard Tucknell was arrested at Gatwick Airport and he was first put on remand and then he went on to be sentenced and he was sentenced to uh, full Sutton prison. Okay. Uh, now, uh, on the 13th of October, I think, 2019, Hucknell was found strangled and stabbed to death in his cell at full Sutton and he was aged 33 at the time of his death. Uh, another prisoner. Uh, was charged with his murder in January 2020. Hucknell was humiliated um, by fellow inmate Paul Fitzgerald uh, on the 13th um, in October that of that year. He was being humiliated by him, by this Paul Fitzgerald, who is a psychopath, really. Now, Paul Fitzgerald tortured Richard Hucknell for one hour and 19 minutes in his cell in this HMP Full Sutton prison. Fitzgerald claims that he was crying. Fitzgerald claims that he was carrying out poetic justice for those who were targeted by Richard Hucknell. He told the jury at Whole Crown Court that during the five-day trial that he wanted Hucknell to know just how it felt. During this trial, further details of Hucknell's violent murder was revealed and was made public. Hucknell's hands and feet had been tied before being gagged, strangled using electrical cord. He's also been raped when he was alive, having his jaw broken, using a kitchen utensil, and it was a spoon that was inserted into his anus. Then he had a pen with the blade, a uh, pen sliced, you know, with the blade attached to it, inserted in his nose, up into his brain. The attack was described by the prosecution as prolonged attack 
designed to humiliate and degrade Hucknall. Fitzgerald, who was discovered by prison officers striding over the body, covered in blood. Now, despite Fitzgerald's um, claiming that he carried out this justice, you know, of Hucknall's victims, um, listen, that's untrue, okay? It's like, I mean, he may have thought that as part of his twisted mind. He may have. But he also had people, you see, who had suffered at his hands anyway before. This man wasn't killing um, Hucknell, Richard Hucknell, because of the children he abused. Because this man himself, as a teen in 2014, he was convicted of, uh, of indecent assault himself. In 2009, I think he was convicted of enforced imprisonment and intention to commit sexual assault on women. I don't know if he ever touched children, but the thing is he was still an abuser. He was still a sexual predator, this man. And this is what I say about when people say to me, you know, they get put on section 47, they're protected, they're protected. You cannot protect these sorts of criminals. They can't be protected. You can't be with them 24 hours a day. There's not enough staff. He was on a unit for sexual offenders, but with many crimes that commit, and when a lot of people attack, and we spoke about this in a lot of cases, when inmates attack other inmates, they are sexual offenders or murderers themselves that do it. Now, <laughs> Fitzgerald was a serious criminal, really. Now, he was in there for a long time, and, um, you know, he had this, he was going to humiliate Hucknall. He was going to abuse Hucknall. In the end, he murdered him. It was that quick. One hour and 19 minutes of abuse. Not a guard in sight. They didn't even know it was happening for that long. Someone reported it. By the time they got there, this man was dead. Now I'm going to leave it up to you what you think about that. But this criminal that done this, he was a danger to society himself. And I think actually that people are not so concerned about Hucknall's murder. No, they're not. They're really not. But they are concerned that this man, I think not concerned anymore, I think this concerns the wrong way. This man was a danger. He had approached an older woman in the street and asked her for directions and then held a knife to her, threatened to sexually assault her and stuff. So people that this man has attacked are probably grateful. They're probably thinking, thank God he's locked up. He's not going to get out for many, many years. It's Gerald. But I always say about these people in prison, don't I? I always say that, that you know, they do these crimes without a fault of the victims that they're doing it to, without a fault of the communities that these people live in. Now Malaysia was shocked actually by the sentence that Hucknall got. They didn't think it was enough. They wanted longer. You know there's lots of changes now abroad uh, in these countries coming in and have come in actually since this where the laws are getting stricter because they don't want this to happen. So let's get back to this Fitzgerald because it's really about him this last bit isn't it really. Now Fitzgerald <laughs> he was this sexually motivated criminal really that's what he was about. I think once he's um, Fitzgerald was Soon after he was caught, there was a search of his home and they found a diary of his and uh, they found this message written that he boasted that he loved raping women. He also messaged, um, a message that was written by him uh, showed that he had fantasies, you know, of um, touching um, a four-year-old boy. He had these fantasies about that. Uh, another claim that he had sexual intercourse with an elderly woman. So, you know, he wasn't normal himself, was he? 
if that's the, the word. I mean, what is normal? So I don't know whether he killed Hucknall because he didn't like Hucknall or because he was having faults about having sexual intercourse himself with a four-year-old boy and maybe didn't like himself for that. Yes, he was a rapist and, and stuff of women, but he hadn't actually touched children at this point, but he had wrote that he was having his fantasies about it. And so did he kill Hucknall? One, because if he killed him, he knew he couldn't get out. He was never ever gonna get out of prison. Plus, did he kill him because it made me feel like how bad he was feeling about himself? I mean, he was a rapist. He's a psychopath. He's an absolute psychopath. He is, I think the judge said it, he is a psychopath. And so really, I suppose, you know, you could say the only good thing that's come out of this case is that there's another criminal now that's not gonna be out on the streets attacking women and children because if he was having fantasies about this, he could have in the end enacted on them. And that would have been terrible because this man was a very violent man. He did say, and we've said it before, that he wanted to do this to Hucknall because of these children. And, and you know, somewhere in this man's mind, that's what he could have thought he was doing. I think Fitzgerald killed Richard Hucknall because he could, because he wanted to, not because of what he'd done, but because <laughs> This man was a killer. He would have always done something. And if it wasn't Richard, it would have been somebody else. But Richard Hucknell had a terrible death. And, you know, I say this all the time. If these criminals, like him, knew what would happen to them on the inside, really, because they think they're going to be protected you know, they're gonna put me on this section 47. They may put you on section 47 for a couple of years and then you're out. You're out in these, you know, with other sex offenders like Fitzgerald. And there's many, many people like Fitzgerald in prison just waiting for a new paedophile to walk through the door. So Fitzgerald, I think on the 24th of November, 2020 was handed a life sentence for Hucknall's murder and the judge stated that he must serve a minimum of 34 years for that murder. Now, 34 years, when you think Hucknell, for the damage he did, he may not have killed any children, but the hundreds and hundreds of children that we know of, that he abused, damaged for life, and he got a minimum of 25. And yet, Fitzgerald killed him. Yes, it was a terrible murder. Yes, he tortured him. Yes, he did all that stuff to him. But he got 34. 34 years. More than what Hucknall got, really. So listen, this man's probably never going to be out. He has to serve a minimum of 34 years. And yeah, before he's eligible for parole, the judge said he was sadistic, which he was. He was. But wasn't Hucknall sadistic in what he did? He may not have killed these children, but he was certainly sadistic towards them in the abuse that he made them suffer. Uh, it was premeditated, this nature of attack. Yes, it was, absolutely. It was planned. He told people that, you know, he had thoughts about doing it and he was going to do it and he didn't give a gap, didn't care about the consequences for doing it. Um, and you got to think is if it took an hour and 19 minutes on this attack, and the prison cards couldn't help him. How are they gonna help anybody else? So these cases, this case especially, it's quite a long case because we talked about a lot of things in this case and we've ended now with another killer, Fitzgerald, which is not gonna get out. So we've, in this case, we've looked at um, Hucknell himself, his offenses, his trial, the evidence now, the new techniques and the new evidence. You know, we can bring out new techniques and stuff, but so do these paedophiles. They continue to evolve, and so do we, to try and catch them. 
Remember, Murder Analyzed is a channel about awareness. It's about knowing what's out there and how you can stop things happening. So this was online. This is abroad. And if this case tells you anything, is that this tourism stuff they're doing, you know, if sex tourism trade in Malaysia and these other countries, it's not going to be as easy anymore. If you are caught there, even if you're not caught there, but you are caught by one of these agencies like Australia or America or here, you will be prosecuted in your own country for what you've done by using this um, extraterritorial um, stuff. You, listen, you, you cannot get away with it. You may think you can, as Hucknell did, thought he could get away with it. And he did for over 10 years. But that's only because we're now much more advanced in our technologies. You wouldn't get away with it for 10 years now. You will be caught. And I think if this case tells these people anything, is that someday you could end up just like Hucknell if you don't stop abusing these children. So this has been the case of Richard Hucknell. You know, yes, he was arrested and charged in the UK, but his offences were in Malaysia. Many, many victims of sexual abuse, uh, indecent images of children, videos, possession, distributing, everything. Anything you can think of, this man done it to his children, to these children. You know what to do, you can subscribe anytime you want. You can, you know, follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can also catch this on our new podcast. Um, let's have a chat about murder. So listen, thanks for watching. Thank you for your comments. I think they're great. Keep them coming. And uh, until the next time, bye-bye.